Good afternoon, everyone. Let me welcome you uh, to our 54th annual Cohen Lecture. We're very pleased to have um, Professor William Eskridge with us as our 54th annual Cohen Lecture. The lectureship, as many of you know, was established through the generosity of Adrian S. Cohen in the name of John Cohen. And it allows us to bring to campus each year, in the words of the uh, endowment, a recognized expert to address issues of public or political interest. And our lecturer tonight does just that. Uh, he also is no stranger to Colorado law. He's visited here a number of times. The last time was uh, about a decade ago and in our former habitat. Uh, Professor Eskridge is the John A. Garver Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale. He's an enormously popular teacher and is beloved uh, among the students and alumni from Yale and the eight other schools where he shared his energies uh, on the faculty or as a visitor, including by our Dean Matthew, who had him as a judge when she was a student in Moot Court. He's well known for his scholarship in legislation and constitutional law. His 1994 book, Dynamic Statutory Interpretation, was a revolutionary work that articulated an approach to statutory interpretation, practical reasoning, that has cast the whole enterprise in a new light. Better than the charmingly simplistic theories of original intent, textualism, and so on that some of us studied. The idea of practical reasoning is that we ought to turn to an admittedly complex but realistic way to search out what the law says or means to say. So we look at things like the conventions of language, historical interpretations, background history of the law, and how the law fits with the norms of other laws, and also at the consequences of particular interpretations. Bill Eskridge's 2010 book, Super Statutes with John Farajan, beckons us to look beyond the US Constitution itself to find a new constitutionalism, arguing that our small c constitution is effectively comprised of bodies of laws that articulate norms and values that better represent who we are as a people. As with his pathbreaking work in statutory interpretation, Professor Eskridge was also a pioneer in the scholarship concerning gay marriage. His 1992 article in the Virginia Law Review posited that the issue had its greatest analog in challenges to interracial marriage. By the time he published the article, he was already representing in court male partners denied the right to marry in the District of Columbia. Now Congress later effectively undermined the civil rights theory of the right to same-sex marriage in the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996. But now the tide is changing, gradually, inexorably. While there remains a public opinion divide among age groups, several state courts and even legislatures are accepting same-sex marriage. They implicitly concede an argument that uh, Bill Eskridge has made in his recent Oxford Press book, Gay Marriage for Better or for Worse, that says that in places where such unions are allowed, the institution of marriage is still alive and well. The movement by individual states may effectively circumvent DOMA. That's the act that was so overwhelmingly passed and then signed into law by President Clinton some 15 years ago. And as for the civil rights argument, just three weeks ago, Attorney General Holder announced that the Obama administration would back off 
from defending the act and questioned its constitutionality as applied to gay couples. Bill Eskridge vindicated. Please welcome our 54th Cohen Lecturer, Professor William Eskridge. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dean. There are a number of my former students uh, here today uh, as officials of the law school, uh, and I'm very uh, proud of them. I'm also always proud to be in Colorado. As the dean said, I've been here before. Uh, the first time I was here was uh, 20 years ago or so, visiting a very dear friend who was teaching here. And I had one of the most uh, ineffable experiences I've ever had in my life. It was in the winter, and you all do have winters uh, here, uh, I am persuaded. Uh, my friends had a Volkswagen bug that they lent me for the day while they, one taught in the engineering school and one taught in the law school, and they said, they pointed me to this big tall mountain uh, with clouds on it, and they said, drive up that mountain and you'll have this wonderful experience. So I hopped in the Volkswagen bug, straight shift, I enjoyed driving it, and up I went, slowly, uh, and about a third of the way up, it started snowing. It had been clear uh, down in the lowlands, started snowing, and I kept winding my way up, and the snow became a blanket, so that by the time I reached the top of where you could drive, it was virtually a blizzard. And then I hiked up uh, another 100 feet or 200 feet before it occurred to me that I might be lost in some kind of blizzard, and so I retreated back. It was like a scene from Thomas Mann going up the mountain uh, here in Boulder. Uh, this is the most beautiful countryside in America. Uh, it was also a beautiful introduction by the dean, uh, and I want to tie the Cohen lecture directly uh, to the points that the dean made, because uh, much of my career in public law, say beyond statutory interpretation, has been thinking about how minority social movements have transformed and interacted with constitutional, large-c constitutional law. Uh, and that gives me the uh, idea for today's lecture, to think more deeply and historically about concepts of both discrimination and liberty. And so the, the title of the lecture is very provocative. It's deliberately provocative, Discrimination to Protect Liberty. Uh, and I imagine some of you are wondering, am I in favor of that? Am I going to be critical of that? Uh, what stance should we uh, take there? Well, I just want to start off descriptively and historically, and I'll end up normatively. Uh, and I would urge you in the question and answer to um, press this in any direction that you prefer. Uh, I want to use as my frame of reference social movements uh, and the struggle for anti-discrimination rules uh, protecting uh, racial uh, and sexual minorities as well as women. Uh, the idea of discrimination to protect liberty is not a new idea. It's an old idea. It's an established idea, frankly, in Anglo-American law. Uh, it's the notion that exceptions to general anti-discrimination laws or anti-discrimination norms can be justified when enforcement of full formal equality would unduly infringe upon some people's liberties or freedoms. And to give you an example that seems to be settled in our polity, but I invite you to question, both administrators in the EOC and judges, though not the Supreme Court, but judges in the DC Circuit and other esteemed appellate judges have generally interpreted federal and state anti-discrimination laws to allow religions to discriminate in their choice of ministers, priests, or rabbis on the basis not just of religion, which maybe doesn't surprise you, but also other characteristics as well, like sex. The Roman Catholic Church discriminates on the basis of sex and the choice of its priests. Race, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints until uh, recent generation discriminated on the basis of race and its choice of religious personnel. Uh, and then less well-known churches do these kind of discriminations as well. Uh, the interpretation of Title VII and many other anti-discrimination laws that reach employment has generally created this ministerial exemption. The discrimination is allowed in order to give space to religious liberty. Now let's think about that in light of uh, recent cases. And one uh, reason I focus on this as my lecture topic is that public law is now filled with these clashes between the anti-discrimination norm as applied to sex, gender, and sexuality and the liberty norm protecting often traditionalist parents and others who feel encumbered by the anti-discrimination idea. 
The brunt of much of this uh, uh, is sexual minorities and gender minorities, but as we'll see in today's lecture, it is not limited to those groups. So start with California Proposition 8, which has very distinguished uh, ancestry here in Colorado. Uh, in 2008, uh, as you know, there was an initiative to override the California marriage cases, which it, as a matter of California state constitutional law, recognized same-sex marriage in that state. Uh, the mainstay of the argument in the Proposition 8 campaign is also the mainstay in almost every anti-gay public initiative or referendum campaign of the last 35 years. Uh, and that has been the argument that equal treatment of quote-unquote homosexuals means that parents and religious persons will lose liberties. Uh, the argument made its public debut in Anita Bryant's famous Save Our Children campaign in Dade County, Florida in 1977. Uh, Dade County had enacted an anti-discrimination ordinance uh, mainly applicable to employment. Anita Bryant, who was a parent raising children in Dade County, was alarmed that this would mean that public schools could not discriminate against lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals in hiring public school teachers. Her argument was that this was a sacrifice of her rights as a religious person, her rights as a parent, and her children's rights to the safety and protection against homosexuals and lesbians. Uh, she won that campaign, uh, and through the 1980s and the 1990s, the Protect Children and Parents Against Raging Homosexuals uh, was a very popular argument. And indeed, it received its greatest publicity, at least on the national stage here in Colorado. You all in 1992 adopted Amendment 2, which preempted uh, municipal ordinances, including one here in Boulder, as well as an executive order that protected lesbian and gay employees, etc., against discrimination. Uh, this was overridden at the state level by Amendment 2. The arguments by the supporters of Amendment 2 were taken straight out of, uh, but were a degraded form of the arguments made even by Anita Bryant in 1977. Uh, and the argument was, aside from their standard arguments that lesbian and gay people were diseased and had short lifespans, both inaccurate, uh, they argued that parents, landlords, and churches will lose liberties if gays are assured equal treatment in the state of Colorado. That argument assured the amendment a narrow victory at the polls, but also undermined the amendment when it reached the Supreme Court, which struck it down in Romer versus Evans. These arguments all returned in California uh, in support of Proposition 8. The adherents' main argument, and actually I think maybe their only analytical argument, was that if homosexual marriage were not overturned, schools would be required to teach children that there is no difference between gay marriage and traditional or real marriage. And the argument was that this would sacrifice the liberty of parents to the education of their children, a privacy concern. We've also seen the argument discriminate to protect liberty made usually successfully in cases involving freedom of association. Uh, let me just mention three of them. Uh, the freedom of association cases were originally civil rights cases in the 1950s and the 1960s where the NAACP and other civil rights groups that were being literally persecuted by southern governments uh, were protected by the Supreme Court against persecution based upon a non-textual right of association. Traditionalists revived these cases in the 1980s as a way of protecting private social clubs against integration by women, but unsuccessfully. In the Roberts case and the J.C.'s case, to name the two most prominent ones, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized the right of expressive association by the social clubs in those cases but ruled that the right of association in those cases was not weighty enough to override the anti-discrimination norm as applied to women. The argument, however, was much more successful in the very famous Boy Scouts versus Dale case the Supreme Court handed down in the year 2000. The Boy Scouts of America tells youth in its handbook, I take it, that they should be morally straight. A normative mission which the Boy Scouts and Chief Justice Rehnquist interpreted as inconsistent with tolerating openly gay assistant scoutmasters. Uh, 
based upon this right of expressive association and the moral commitment of the Boy Scouts to morally straight Cub Scouts, uh, the Supreme Court struck down as applied a New Jersey law that prohibited anti-gay discrimination in places of public accommodation, which they had interpreted to include the Boy Scouts. Now, interestingly, this last term, the Supreme Court did not follow Dale to require the Hastings College of Law, a public law school in California, to subsidize the Christian Legal Society, which discriminated against what they called unrepentant homosexuals. Uh, and the argument there was that the state policy uh, was a limited public forum uh, at the university's uh, law school. Uh, and the limited public forum could be applied neutrally uh, to require non-discrimination by all groups, including the Christian Legal Society. So the fact that there is an argument based on liberty does not mean that argument usually wins. Vide the sex discrimination cases and vide the Hastings College case. Here's a very interesting and perhaps unexpected example of the idea of discrimination to protect liberty. And this is the most recent Supreme Court abortion rights case, Gonzalez versus Carhartt. Uh, the most successful strategy for pro-life groups to chip away at the pro-choice decision in Roe versus Wade uh, has been libertarian strategies focused on women's abortion decision making. So the old arguments about the fetus as a person or based upon the disgusting features to the opponents of abortion have now been superseded by libertarian arguments to restrict a woman's right to choose. Sounds oxymoronic, but listen to the logic. The states under this argument are allowed to protect parental rights when minors want abortions. So it might not be the liberty of the minors, but instead the liberty of the parents, who do have a lot of decision-making authority in all of the states over their minor children. It's the right to impose informed consent now including sonogram viewing in some states, requirements on women who are considering abortions. And it's the right of states to require reasonable waiting periods for women seeking abortions. Carhartt is important because beyond these earlier decisions, the Supreme Court in Carhartt relied on abortion or regret, uh, the assertion that many women regret having abortions and that it traumatizes them to uphold a substantive limit on abortions, i.e. the partial birth ban found in that Bush era statute and supported by Operation Outcry. Now those are some recent examples and I think these examples are going to multiply in the next several years. This is a topic which is going to be an important uh, constitutional topic throughout this decade. Let me now situate it historically before I conclude with some normative analysis. And I want to think about some similarities in the experience of people of color in this country, women in this country, and sexual and gender minorities in this country. And each of these groups, though at different rates and in different periods and with different modalities, has gone through the same normative transition in terms of how society views them and their differentiating trait. Obviously, race for racial minorities, sex for women versus men, uh, and sexual orientation for sexual minorities. All of these minorities and women started in the position in the 19th century and much of the 20th century that society as a whole viewed their variation from the norm, i.e. white heterosexual men, as malignant. Society in that period, American society for most of our history, viewed any racial gender or sexual variation as malignant and the groups afflicted with this variation as socially inherently inferior. This assertion of inferiority drove pervasive legal discriminations including slavery and then apartheid, discriminations obviously against blacks, coverture, discriminations against married women where married women had few if any legal rights for much of American history, and job exclusions even after coverture ended, uh, and then the outlaw status that is familiar to us for lesbians, gay men, and uh, bisexuals. Over time, but after many decades and generations of subordination, the subordinated groups sought literal liberty protections once they were able to be organized. 
The liberty protections for blacks and gays were in the criminal procedure arena. For blacks and women, the big struggles were to own property. Uh, and for women and for gays, the struggles were for sexual privacy, among others. Now, as you know, I hope, uh, the struggles uh, by these various groups to persuade Americans that their variation was not malignant uh, was successful. Uh, but it did not produce full equality. Uh, initially, the campaign of minority groups for some kind of social acceptance, the most that you can hope for uh, is that you can persuade most Americans that your variation is not malignant, but instead that it is tolerable. But it's still a variation from the norm and mainstream society still believes that the norm is preferable. Okay? So African Americans spent most of the 20th century trying to persuade white Americans uh, that uh, being African was not a malignant variation, but was unsuccessful in persuading most of those white Americans for most of the century uh, that there was no difference between white and black. Uh, the same has been true of women and men. The same has been true of gay and straight. But this is still a major advance for gay people to move from outlaw status, which would justify virtually any discrimination against gay people, uh, to a status where being gay is tolerable even if icky is a major legal step forward. Okay? It really is. Uh, and uh, it is a step that America has by and large taken with some holdout jurisdictions. Uh, to take this step legally, the major battleground is, of course, anti-discrimination laws, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, such as ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which is proposed in Congress. I believe one of the sponsors is Representative Paulus here of this district. It's not been passed yet, and it will not be passed soon. Uh, but these are classic examples of battlegrounds for the proposition that gay might not be good, uh, but it's tolerably uh, enough for straight society. Now, there's still opposition to this. And the opposition is fierce, even from a movement from malignant to tolerable variation. Uh, the modernization, the modern justification for treating these minorities differently and discriminating against them uh, is you never abandon the direct denigrations uh, the uh, arguments, well, these people are simply inferior. Though those arguments do go into a closet at some point in public culture, they never go away. You supplement those direct denigrations with arguments that equality would sacrifice liberties. So, for example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was viciously and vigorously opposed, mainly based upon the argument advanced by Robert Bork of the Yale Law School, not just Southern senators. Uh, the argument against the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was that protecting against discrimination on color grounds will violate white people's freedom of association. Uh, abortion choice uh, is attacked on the grounds that it would sacrifice not only the lives of fetuses, but also the liberties of husbands and parents. And then the argument was, of course, that gay rights would corrupt children and would harm parental rights. Let me linger, if I could, on the tolerable variation, because that's still where we are as regards sexual orientation in America, and probably for many people on some of these other variations as well. Here are some of the familiar tropes that cut across the race, sex, and sexual orientation divide uh, and characterize arguments against uh, equal protection norms for these minorities. One very popular trope is the no promotion trope. Uh, and that is that any kind of movement toward equal treatment is attacked as not toleration, but promotion of the minority or its characteristic conduct. So a major argument against uh, recognition of different race marriage, which was the big holdout point on race discrimination, was that the state should not be promoting racial mixing. Even after the Civil Rights Act, that argument was made. Uh, a major argument uh, and successful area for abortion has been the funding cases, uh, where constitutionally and as a matter of policy, 
uh, the pro-choice forces have not been successful in seeking uh, funding for abortions uh, as it has sometimes for choice of abortions. And as far as gay rights is concerned, what I call no promo homo arguments remain very popular. And that was the main argument of Proposition 8. California is not a reactionary jurisdiction. It's a very liberal jurisdiction as far as it goes in the United States. And yet the only argument essentially in favor of Prop 8 and against the marriage cases in California was that if you allowed same-sex marriage in California, that would promote homosexuality and would require schools in California not to denigrate gay marriage and gay relationships compared to straight. Uh, you also saw that argument in the Boy Scouts case, uh, that if you imposed a non-discrimination requirement on the Boy Scouts, that would require them to promote homosexuality, which was inconsistent with their devotion to moral straightness. Another trope that you see, and I'm sure you see this in Colorado still, is what I call crossing the Rubicon tropes. Uh, and that is that if you make the move from no law to an anti-discrimination law, if you cross that line, it's like crossing the Rubicon or falling off the cliff, and from that will result massive disaster. Huge losses of liberty, social collapse, God will send the locusts, and these very same crossing the Rubicon arguments were made by the very same people, I might add, uh, against integration. Uh, these were the southern states' arguments in Brown. Uh, these were arguments against rights for women. These were anti-feminist arguments against abortion, uh, and it was arguments against both gay marriage uh, and gay anti-discrimination laws. When I say some of the same people made these arguments, I can give you a name, and that is, I was born in West Virginia, a beautiful mountainous state, not as beautiful as Colorado. We are home to the longest serving senator in American history, now deceased. He was Robert Byrd, a former member of the Ku Klux Klan, and a vigorous opponent of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, based upon the liberty argument, which he found in the Bible. Uh, and his long tirade against the Civil Rights Act was based in large part upon reading biblical passages which established that God hates integration, God hates racial mixing, and the liberty of the religiously devout uh, could only be ensured by discriminating against African Americans. Byrd lived long enough also to be a major proponent of the Defense of Marriage Act where he made exactly the same arguments. And I'm proud to say cited one of my early books though, uh, to demonize the argument, but that was all right. He cited a lot of the same biblical passages and so on. Same crossing the Rubicon sort of rhetoric. Now, by the way, I hope I don't need to say to this academic audience uh, that when integration occurred, when women achieved equal rights, when married women could sue, when gay people were no longer outlaws, uh, there were no locusts, not a single one. Uh, marriage survived. The country suffered no discernible social harm from any of these events, in my opinion. And then the third kind of argument, uh, and this is one that has gained in popularity. Uh, the others are old reliables. Uh, here is one that's gained in popularity, and this is what I call decision-making regret. Uh, and we see that now as a major argument in the abortion uh, cases, not just informed consent laws, but the Carhartt uh, partial birth abortion decision as well, and that is the idea that women regret abortions, and the state needs to protect the liberty of women by requiring all of this process, which makes abortion much more difficult. Now, it's an old argument as far as gays are concerned. Uh, it's long been a, a big trope that uh, uh, homosexuality is a choice, that many homosexuals regret choosing homosexuality, and if they go through re reparative therapy or attend church services, uh, then they can be cured of that. The final movement or aspiration for these minority social groups is socially and legally to move their variation from the category of tolerable to benign. And indeed, if the minority group persuades the polity that its variation is benign, racial variation, sex variation, sexual orientation variation, then the anti-discrimination norm will sweep. Uh, very often, ironically, and not coincidentally, 
Marriage equality is often the last frontier. It's the last bastion of discrimination, at least as a public matter. Now, even if, and this is a very interesting thing about our society, even if the anti-discrimination norm sweeps, and as a matter of public culture, for example, we do believe in our public culture today, though many Americans dissent from this privately, we officially believe, and most of us, I think, sincerely believe, that racial variation is benign. I think racial variation is arbitrary. It's not just benign, it's, it's a construct. And that, therefore, it is literally irrational to make distinctions based upon race. Now, interestingly, even though I think we have a consensus on that norm, we still allow outliers to discriminate so long as the discrimination is contained. Now, what do I mean by that? We still allow discrimination even along lines of race, which has been a much discussed and much deliberated category, if the discrimination is important to a traditionalist identity, if the discrimination does not undermine the minority group's core liberties, and if the state is not asked to subsidize or in other direct ways support the discrimination. So for example, and I don't want to give you any ideas, uh, burning a cross on your own lawn is probably protected in most cases by the First Amendment. You know, even if motivated and expressing racist sentiments on your part. Uh, contrast the Bob Jones case, which was about 30 years ago, where Bob Jones University asked to continue to receive uh, income tax deductions and exemptions uh, even though it openly discriminated on the basis of race. The Supreme Court went against that, and Bob Jones uh, later apologized and ceased at least the outward racial discrimination. So that's an example of benign variation, that even holdouts like Bob Jones University, and at least in public culture, in my opinion, uh, there was no uh, more stubborn opponent of integration uh, than the reverends Bob Jones and their university. And yet I think, last time I looked, uh, you go on their website and there actually is an apology uh, for their decades of open discrimination. Now here are what I see the normative questions for this interesting little paradox uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, and that is that liberty, as a normal matter and as a legal matter, entails the right to exclude. The right to property, for example, now, I took property at Yale, and so I don't know as much as you do. But I think we're probably on common ground. This is literally true. I, everything I'm telling you, I think, is literally true. Uh, the right to property allows a person to keep people of color off his land and other people. Uh, freedom to marry allows a woman to exclude other women or unattractive people from her choice pool. Uh, freedom of association, now many of you are laughing because you're saying that's not empirically supported, but uh, you do have that uh, right, uh, uh, as it may. Uh, freedom of association allows a parade to exclude openly gay marchers. These are relatively uncontroversial propositions in our society. Anti-discrimination law, therefore, always restricts liberties. The discriminating person, you know, however you're covered, is no longer free, without legal result anyway, to exclude or isolate himself from others because of the protected trait, be it race, sex, sexual orientation, or whatnot. So there's an inherent tension, relatively unexplored in our literature, and hopefully not in our classrooms, between the notion of liberty, which is a right to exclude, and remember, we fought a whole revolution around that idea and the idea of anti-discrimination. And we have kind of fought a civil war along that idea. There's an inherent tension. So here's the normative question. How ought we to arbitrate the mobile line between protected liberty and illegal discrimination? Now, this is a larger question. It plays out in constitutional law, as in the Dale case, uh, as in the Romer and Evans case. But it can obviously play out at the policy level as well, at the state level as well as the national level. Now here, in my opinion, are three variables which I think are relevant. Now coming as I do from the Yale Law School, you will not get from me a bright line black letter rule 
as to how you should resolve these cases. Instead, you will only get normative questions that I think are relevant and that I invite you to reflect upon uh, if you think they are relevant as well. The first one is this, and that is how private, by which I mean confined, or public, by which I mean with obvious spillover effects, is the liberty being asserted. Let's say citizen A owns a building. If the building is his domicile and nothing more, uh, A can lawfully discriminate and maybe morally discriminate on some uh, metric on the basis of race, sex, etc., when he decides whom to invite or allow into his home. And indeed, there might even be constitutional problems if the state tried to regulate whom you can invite into your home, whom you can exclude from your home. But let's say instead uh, that A rents units in his building. It's a big building. Maybe he lives in the penthouse, but he also rents units in the building or even runs a business out of it. Now then, there are obvious spillover effects to the right to exclude that he ordinarily has as an owner of property. He is now more in the public sphere once he becomes a landlord, once he becomes a business, once he becomes maybe even a public accommodation. Though sometimes as a matter of policy, if he's just renting out one unit or two, uh, he's given a pass from most anti-discrimination laws that apply to landlords. Then consider, finally, A turns his building into a hospital. Once he does that, he loses most of his ability to discriminate based on race, sex, religion, uh, and in some jurisdictions, sexual orientation. But uh, A has a right, the Supreme Court tells us, to refuse to perform abortions at the hospital if he so chooses, which is a kind of discrimination. So that's the first question. How private, by which I mean confined, or public with spillover effects, is the liberty that is being asserted? And the way we normatively evaluate it, obviously, is culturally specific. And we might have different reads on culture, which are perfectly legitimate. And my read is, of course, worth nothing uh, more than yours, particularly in the state of Colorado. Second, how pushy does the state want to be, or how aggressive can the state be justified in enforcing parentalist policies? I wrote paternalist, but I mean parentalist. Dads are parents as well. Moms are parents. So what should the state policy be, considering overall efficiency, fairness, and social friction, just to take three important variables? There is a consensus, as I suggested, that race discrimination is unfair morally. It's inefficient in terms of the economy and the functioning of society and causes needless social friction. The state can even perform an educative role uh, because we think these things are true. Now, if citizen B owns a business, the state teaches him that his racist premises, and B might indeed be a racist, but the state teaches him that these premises are unfair, they're idiotic decision-making, and they cause social friction. At the very least, B will keep these premises in the closet and actually might even run a legitimate business that does not discriminate based upon these realities, quite possibly. But does the same analysis apply if B is a woman considering abortion, based upon the argument that some women regret that choice? Now, I'm on the other side of the Supreme Court on this issue, which has valorized the problems with abortion choice, because there is a lot of social science evidence that I think it would behoove the court to read, that including for young women, including for adolescent women, the choice process itself, where the woman is making decisions without a lot of state pressure or bullying, is one where not only do women make serious decisions without state meddling, but there are decisions that are actually empowering for the decision makers themselves. And a lot of the literature does involve adolescent women uh, who are caricatured by the Supreme Court as immature decision makers. It's, it's uh, evidence uh, that we reproduce in our sexuality, gender, and the law case book, uh, and that's been, um, uh, I think, very much validated. Third question, and my last one. 
And that is, interestingly, does protection of liberty in the particular circumstance enhance the functioning of our pluralist democracy? Uh, and indeed, I think and would maintain uh, that there are some liberties, including liberties relied on by groups that I'm opposed to, that are democracy-enhancing liberties. The main democracy-enhancing liberties that have occurred to me are freedom to dissent from social orthodoxy, freedom of speech types of things, freedom of press, including press we despise, I suppose even including the National Enquirer and the press that tell us of Tom Cruise's Martian love child. Uh, and then, of course, freedom of association, the freedom that is discussed in the Boy Scouts case and the Christian Legal Society case just last term. But I would also add that anti-discrimination also uh, is, an anti is a democracy-enhancing form of liberty that minorities who live in fear of discrimination will be or tend to be politically mobilized. Uh, gay people here in Colorado in the 1960s were literally outlaws and were politically immobilized from uh, being any kind of voice in Colorado politics, even though there were a fair number of people who had a gay, lesbian, or bisexual orientation. They were literally criminals. They could be fired from any job, and they sometimes were. They could be harassed by the police. Their children could be taken away from them. If they were immigrants, they could be deported based on a Supreme Court decision that anyone who'd ever had sex with another man was a psychopathic person who could be deported. You could be sent to a mental hospital. You could be electroshocked. And all of these things did happen in Colorado in the 1950s and the 1960s. You can imagine. Uh, that that had a democracy depressing effect, at least as regards these issues. Uh, as Colorado adopted for sodomy reform and then some very limited anti-discrimination um, uh, laws, mostly municipal, uh, and then later at the state level, uh, this has, I think, and I would maintain, has enriched the democratic process in the state. Now, interestingly, I think the Boy Scouts case where I was long skeptical, and certainly think the Rehnquist opinion is more of a caricature of a judicial opinion than a real one. Uh, Justice Stevens, who was a brilliant lawyer, clearly has the better of the legal arguments in the Boy Scouts case. But uh, I do think the uh, brief written by Michael McConnell, later a judge on the Tenth Circuit and now a law professor again, for the Boy Scouts, uh, I think made excellent points for the Boy Scouts uh, that the state was being too aggressive uh, in regulating private organizations, whatever this business about moral straightness was concerned. Uh, and he tied it explicitly in McConnell's brief to the rich tradition recognized in de Tocqueville onwards, uh, where America is a society of joiners and associations, and it is probably good for America, uh, both socially and politically, that there is a wide variety of associations. And so if you want to call yourself morally straight and then later you interpret that as anti-homosexual, it seems to me uh, this is something that I would consider worth protecting. Uh, so I'm kind of with Rehnquist, though I find the entire opinion uh, more comical uh, than serious. But I'm kind of also with the court in the Hastings case that I described earlier, where Justice Ginsburg's opinion for the court, which was a serious bit of legal analysis, thank you, Justice Ginsburg, um, uh, met by a hysterical dissent with not a lot of law and a lot of hysteria in it, I think the Ginsburg uh, uh, analysis makes a very good case that a public school uh, applying viewpoint neutrality does not have to subsidize discrimination uh, against uh, gay people. And I think the political culture of Hastings and San Francisco uh, probably neither enriched nor depleted by that decision uh, but I think that one was correct. So those are my views, and I have pretty much stuck to what I promised the dean I would do, which was 40, 45 minutes. And we would be delighted to have questions, which the dean will, I'm sure, neutrally arbitrate. Yeah, yeah, you're the dean. You're the, you're the decider. You're the decider, and you're also the chooser. Discrimination 
in the name of liberty or, or defending discrimination in the name of liberty is somehow fundamentally different than defending any other violation of law in the name of liberty. And, and I wonder if that mm. distinction is, is really justified. I mean, not only anti-discrimination laws, mm. but all laws restrict religious liberty. A, a law against homicide means that if your religion believes in human sacrifice, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to forego that. Or, or more, more uh, specifically, the, the Supreme Court case in, involving peyote says that uh, you know your religious liberty does not allow you to, to use peyote, um, which is forbidden by a, a facially neutral law. Couldn't your same analysis be applied to, to any of those uh, uh, alleged rights to, to violate laws in the name of, of religious liberty? I like that. Yeah, I like that question. Uh, let's take the peyote case which I think is an interesting case. Now, uh, I'll defer to anybody in the audience who's a real expert on the Smith case. This was Smith versus Employment Division, right? With Kierke 1990, an opinion by Justice Scalia. Oregon, I believe, had a law, an anti-drug law, probably a fairly garden variety anti-drug law, which included peyote, you know, would not have been top of my list for drugs that you're gonna prohibit, but it was in Oregon, and a Native American. Well, that never occurred to me. I, oh, I'm just very conventional. I would think that cocaine and heroin and LSD, you know, the, the stuff in the 60s, I would think those would be the hit list. Peyote, you know, I, I don't have much of a concept of peyote. Uh, so, but there you have it. Uh, that's my ignorance. Uh, a Native American tribe, uh, for them, peyote was a uh, sacramental uh, use. And so they wanted to use peyote for their sacramental purposes. And the state of Oregon said, no, you can't. And they asserted religious liberty in the uh, Supreme Court. Justice Scalia, interestingly, a very devout Catholic, very narrow interpretation of the free exercise clause, limiting a number of earlier precedents, uh, and therefore diminishing the amount of protection that religious liberty uh, has in America, including these Native American tribes. So how would I analyze it? Well, I would analyze it the same, I would analyze it the same way I've just analyzed the Equality, because I think it's, it's about equality. I think it actually is about equality, as well as liberty. Though the restriction itself is not a... Uh, so uh, the, uh, the Native American tribe, uh, I think, is suffering both a liberty deprivation, freedom to exercise their religion, and kind of an equality deprivation as well. That probably every other religion in Oregon, or at least any that would occur to me, uh, is probably unencumbered in its sacramental uh, practices. Well, uh, human sacrifice is, in is that in Oregon, though? Remember, Oregon is a. Oh, no, it's, in ah, it's in Colorado. Yeah, in Oregon, you know, they're do-gooders in Oregon. It's a very wonderful little state or big square state. So here's the way to analyze it. So how private, confined, or public with spillover effects is the liberty being asserted? We're talking about just sacramental use in these blah, blah, blahs. And so not taking the peyote home and handing it out to the children, but purely sacramental use. I would say it seems pretty confined to me. Again, you'd have to look at the facts of the case, see what the state comes up with. Very few spillover effects. Uh, how pushy does the state want to be in enforcing its policies? Uh, now, I myself um, am a bit of a skeptic about state anti-drug policies. Certainly in Washington, D.C., where I live much of the year, uh, the anti-drug policies have been notoriously ineffective. Uh, but it does seem to me to be an important state policy. Uh, again, I don't quite know, I don't know nearly enough about peyote to evaluate, is this one of the drugs that's destroying America's youth? But, you know, it might be. Uh, and, and so that would uh, count a bit for Oregon. Maybe less for me than it does for you. Uh, but bit for Oregon. And then does protection of liberty enhance the function of our pluralist democracy? And I think yes on this one. Yes, I, I like the ideas of religions being given some birth. Uh, uh, for example, the, another case I don't like is the Yarmulke case, decided a few years later. Uh, a rabbi who served in the armed forces uh, for religious reasons was required to wear his Yarmulke. The armed forces says, you know, can't wear headgear. You know, 
except in your private spaces. And the rabbi asked for an exemption. They said, no, no headgear. Can't wear your yarmulke. Well, I don't know. that It's very fundamental to his identity, to his entire religious mission, the way his religion saw it. Uh, is this really a policy the state wants to be pushing? I'm very unimpressed with the state policy. Uh, and does the protection of liberty enhance the function of pluralism? I think, yes, it does. So I'm very skeptical of that as well. Does it rise to a constitutional level? I would vote to strike down the Garmel Cup business. And I would have voted the other way in the Peyote case, maybe more based upon freedom of association uh, than based upon freedom of religion. You know, I don't have a strong view on whether it's, you know, for me to like be more pro-Catholic than Scalia makes me really nervous. Uh, but but uh, uh, gratuitously, let me suggest this hypothesis. Uh, I think freedom of religion, but, and this is social change. You know, in, in my lifetime, the stakes of religion have gotten a lot lower. When I was growing up in the South, the difference between Protestant and Catholic was quite hysterical. The difference between Protestant denominations had people very exercised. There was a lot of anti-Catholic bigotry among Protestants. A lot, of, a lot more anti-Semitism among Catholics and Protestants, maybe than you see today in the public spaces. Uh, the intensity of religion has really been lowered. And religion has, has in many ways become just a nor another normative group, like the Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts morally straight, Catholic Church morally straight. Now, not all their priests are, but the official Catholic Church is morally straight, right? Official Boy Scouts morally straight. Baptist Church morally straight, okay? So, so uh, I think that we've seen, uh, I think society drives law. What, what's legally off the wall is really driven by cultural assumptions. What's legally cogent, I think, is driven by cultural assumptions. And so a lot of claims that would have been freedom of religion claims in the 40s and 50s, I think have now been, been translated into freedom of association claims in the new millennium. So maybe if, if I were on top of all that in 1990, um, I would say freedom of association for the peyote smoking sacramental tribe. But yeah. Well, oh, come on. Come on, go through my variables, go through my variables. How private? Are there spillover effects? <laughs> duh! Uh, duh! Yeah, I think there are spillover effects. Uh, how pu pushy does the state want to be to, in enforcing its anti-execution policies? <laughs> duh! Uh, and does protection of liberty enhance the functioning of our pluralist democracy? Well, if it's human sacrifice, you're removing voters from the rolls. <laughs> and even if it's animal sacrifice, you know, I, I don't ha I'm not on top of all that moral literature. Uh, I, I do confess that I consider that icky, uh, which, is, which is a personal and not legal judgment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. OK, you have to come with better hypotheticals than that. Yeah, that's what that's the argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it feels like that that's something different than these other questions in which you're balancing um, the liberty of other people against uh, what happens with discrimination against a different set of people. So, um, and, and I, it feels much more pernicious to me mm -hmm. um, to to get in um, into discrimination and support discrimination against a certain group in order to protect the very liberty of that group. Or that that's good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I like, I mean, I agree with your point. So this is the sesame seed question. You know, there's one thing here that doesn't belong. Well, I'm going to argue that it does, but I still think you're right. I, I think you're right. Here's the sliver of it that clearly does belong, and that is the parental rights stuff. Because the, a lot of the decision-making regret, you know, has more power, I think, for voters and maybe for justices when you're talking about minors. Now again, I think they do need to read some of the sociology on this. And they need to talk to social workers who actually deal with the women who are seeking these choices. 
So I think this is under-informed. And in fact, I think grotesquely under-informed, frankly. But nonetheless, uh, it has its greatest power there, where the possible regret of the minor, and I do agree with the regret literature that, that, that minor's decision-making is fraught with flaws. I, I, although I think that's also true of adults as well. Uh, and there's a lot of literature on that issue now. Uh, but uh, their regret, and this is why we have in loco parentis, or, or parentis, uh, is that uh, parents, even you know, until you're a legal adult, have a lot of control over your decision making. So the parental rights, which is a privacy right, the Supreme Court has recognized parental rights as privacy rights. They are liberty interests. They are good liberty interests, in, in my opinion. So that's where it has its greatest power, okay? And then I agree with you that, that I'm straying off the reservation, as it were, when I then generalize it. But, but here's where it is, it's sort of an outlier. And that is that, that it, it's both this, it, say you're talking about an adult woman who in Oklahoma, if you want an abortion in Oklahoma, uh, you are required to have a sonogram and the doctor is required to explain it to you. You're required to sit there. You're required to watch it. And you cannot get that abortion in Oklahoma unless there is a certificate that you have been shown the sonogram, it's been explained to you, and you have watched it, right? And that's on top of other burdens that Oklahoma places on abortion choice, OK? Now, that's discrimination against women. You know, there's no medical procedure that men do that is encumbered with anything like all of the apparatus that Oklahoma now imposes upon women seeking abortions, including stuff that men do that have spillover effects, right? Um, so I think that is discrimination against women, and it is based upon this liberty idea of decision-making regret. So in a literal sense, it fits, but you're quite right to say that it's not the same because the, the woman who's suffering the discrimination is also the woman who's suffering the liberty deprivation. It's all premised on believing that women are somehow deficient, diseased. I mean, you walk right back into the moral vicious forms of discrimination that supposedly have gone beyond. Oh, I like that point. Let me say, here's how I like to put that point. No, 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 I love that point. Because I think it's all sedimentary. There has been a... My colleague Reva Siegel calls it the modernization of justification, but I call it the sedimentation of justification. The old natural law tropes, you know, Adam's rib, you know, Adam is like the thing and the woman is the pale copy, right? You know, so that's the natural, and the homosexuals, of course, are these, whatever idiocy they pick out of the Bible, that's what the homosexuals are. And blacks, I've written a whole article on the whole eschatology of racism. And it's all right out of the Bible, and it's utter nonsense, but it's no more nonsense than the anti-gay readings of the Bible. It's by the same people making the same arguments, doing the same things, the same, the same verses almost, same parts of the Bible, etc. It's all, it's all social construction. So you've got the natural law thing. Uh, and then you've got over it a medicalized discourse. You know, so once doctors start getting into the picture, you we, now we're a modern society, so we no longer, the public discourse is no longer the Bible says this or, you know, natural law believes this. So we have a medical reason, and the medical reason is that women are, you know, hysterical and they're frail. Homosexuals, the doctor said for about 100 years, homosexuals are psychopathic. They're sociopaths. They literally cannot, they're, they're, they're degenerate in a biological sense. This is the, this is the medical reasoning. Okay, and that goes on top of the natural law. But it obviously is sedimented. The natural law is still very important in molding the discourse of the doctors. Now then today, the discourse tends to be, you know, Benthamite, social utilitarian, or even civic republican, right? So this is, the moder this is what Reva Siegel, I think, very usefully calls the most modernized discourse. But it's sedimented that it tends to fall into the same valleys and peaks as the natural law tropes and the, the medical quackery tropes. So you see a lot of echoes of a lot of the same thing. Now again, I know the gay stuff the best, that the, the central trope against gay people that cuts across all of this 
is that, is that sexual minorities are anti-family and are predatory. Those are the central tropes. But very similar tropes against Jews in the South in the 19th century, against African Americans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the natural law idea is that homosexuality is this like sexuality unleashed, it's uncontrolled, it's animalistic. That's the natural law trope. It's like they're animals. Then the medical trope is they're degenerate, sexual psychopaths. The, the American Freudians, not Freud himself, but the, the wacko, the wacko American Freudians. And then you get Anita Bryant, who translates the biblical mythology, the medical mythology, into a Benthamite, and even a privacy. She's like so hip. She's like either read or been told about Griswold versus Connecticut. So she incorporates it not only into like modern Benthamite, you know, utilitarian stuff, but privacy. My privacy as a parent is being invaded because the homosexuals and the lesbians can now be school teachers. So you can see how, yeah, okay, okay, you got it. This is good. You got any more good things for me to think about? This is great. Like much discrimination, <laughs> blundering and misconceived, but go on. <laughs> See, this is a lesson, lesson for all of us, even in the questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The straight man is prohibited from marrying a gay man, for example. <laughs> yeah. Remember my proposition, any anti-discrimination law is going to restrict liberty. And so then the question becomes, how important is the liberty? That's a normative question. And then how justified is the state policy behind the anti-discrimination law? Okay? And criminal laws, of course, restrict liberty in the obvious ways. He's talking in, in the Smith case about a peyote regulation. Okay, let me first of all just put aside, give the historical context for this. Well, it applies equally. You know, so, the, so women are prohibited from marrying other women, uh, the same as men are prohibited from marrying other men, and straight, a straight man is prohibited. You know, it applies to straights as well as gays. Okay? That is the exact same argument that was made in Loving versus Virginia to uphold miscegenation laws. The state of Virginia, with a straight face, said, well, this doesn't actually even discriminate on basis of rights. Because black people are treated the same as white people. Now, that was actually untrue, because they didn't treat black people the same as white people. That was just Virginia's wackiness. Um, but let's say it had been true. It still would have been race discrimination in a very literal sense. You're a couple. Let's say you're a male-female couple in Virginia. Virginia is for lovers, but not all lovers, OK? So you're a couple. You're a male-female couple. Uh, you are uh, of African ancestry. And you say, I want a marriage license, my partner. I say, well, who is partner? Partners of, of European ancestry. They say, no, you cannot get a marriage license because you're of the wrong race. I, Bill Estridge, am of the wrong race. You have to be European, not African. So the discrimination is literally based upon the race of me. And by the way, 
this is, this is how the marriage discrimination is actually a sex discrimination. Same as Loving versus Virginia. If you're a uh, couple that comes in, so you're a different sex couple, say, what about marriage license? I'm a man, she's a woman, they'll give you the marriage license. But if you come in and I'm a woman and she's a woman, they won't. What is the regulatory variable? What is the item that changes, that produces the different legal treatment? My sex. It's literally a sex discrimination. That's indirectly a sexual orientation discrimination because for, it's like Yick Wo versus Hopkins, the old 19th century case where there was a requirement for laundries. And it was only, it was, I mean, it was totally racially neutral and could have been easily justified based on if, you know, inspect laundries so if they burn down, the whole city doesn't burn down. This sounds like a good statute. But in San Francisco, it was only applied against Chinese laundries. And the Supreme Court had no trouble in saying, well, that's a discrimination. We're actually going to strike that down. And the, the gay marriage discrimination is basically just lesbian and gay couples and the occasional confused straight person <laughs> who just wants to marry someone of the same sex because. And, and they do it. They do it. And I think that's fine. I believe their credits to their sexual orientation. But it's like yik wo. There were some non-Chinese laundries that were affected, but it was 90 plus percent Chinese laundries. And the gay marriage ban, not surprisingly, is 90 plus percent gay couples. Okay? So that's, you know, that, that's, the, the, that's, that's that argument. Um, what was the rest of your question? <laughs> so you set me off on that one. That's, this is one of my favorite arguments that I like to hate. I hate that argument. But I like talking about it. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I don't like arguments that say, well, we're just discriminating against everybody, and therefore that justifies it. In fact, it, I mean, conceivably, it makes it worse. If everybody's liberty is being sacrificed and the state justification is not very good, then, yeah, I think that would be the worst. I, I'm giving you what I think are hard cases, but if everybody's liberty is, well, that's the American Revolution, basically, where they said all of our, the Stamp Act, now, how these people got so hysterical about the Stamp Act is beyond me. But, uh, but there they were. Uh, the Stamp Act discriminates against all of us. We're all quite hysterical. Uh, and uh, and they, they saw it as a discrimination. That why should we be taxed you know, differently from all of those people in England, who, of course, are represented in Parliament? So they felt aggrieved by that. We were very whiny people. And the whininess really begins then. Okay? So I think that's the way our forebearers would have seen it. That it's worse when we're all, we're all being denied liberty, and uh, uh, this is just unacceptable. You're discriminated against us, you're denying us the liberty, and we're going to overthrow you. So there you have it. More, more, more. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. And in fact, a lot of these things, like the Colorado case, talk about like Colorado, because some of y'all might be able to remember the, uh, the 1992 referendum and then the later case. Um, the, the church arguments, I think, are, tend to be both libertarian and communitarian. See, so you can be both. It's like the certs debate, which you're probably too young to remember. 
Now there was this horrible debate whether Surtz was a candy mint or breath mint. And uh, the dean. No, it's two, two mints in one. There you have it. It was a Hegelian synthesis. So it's kind of like the Surtz debate. I, I think the uh, church arguments in the, prop, uh, uh, in the Amendment 2 case here in Colorado uh, really were both. If you looked at them from the church's point of view, um, it would really be both. It's really literally our liberty to exclude people from the church. And I think the Boy Scouts would maybe look at it the same way. Uh, our liberty, I mean, we have a liberty to exclude. And we don't want gay people in our church. Or we want the liberty for them not to be ministers or not to be this or not to be that. Same with the Boy Scouts. But if you, if you talk to them long enough, they would also say it's also communitarian is that we have a community, a community within the church. And indeed, of course, you know, for example, if you're a Catholic, particularly, but other religions as well, Judaism, many Protestants, you're part of a long tradition that we're, we're not only a horizontal community, where Catholics were part of the universal Catholic church, Rome, and all of that. We're also vertical continuity going back to St. Peter, if I'm not mistaken, I being a Protestant, so wouldn't swear. So the Catholic church goes back to St. Peter, and part of our tradition is a certain moral teaching which makes us unwilling, for example, to have maybe openly uh, gay priests. Our tradition's perfectly comfortable with closeted gay priests and pedophiles, uh, but, but not openly gay priests. And this is, the way, but this is the way we define our community. And also the way we define, take communitarian one step, what is morally good from our point of view. And the Roman Catholics realize that what they think is morally correct is not necessarily what a public opinion poll is going to produce even in Colorado. But their view is we have a morally coherent philosophy. It's natural law philosophy. Uh, it has been tested by centuries of back and forth and deliberation, experimentation and whatnot, because a lot of their views have changed. Um, and, but this is what we think is morally right. It's what we advance as morally right in a democracy where we don't always win, but we're always in there with our point of view, or at least often in there with our point of view, which, by the way, uh, has been fairly consistently uh, anti-discrimination. The Catholic point of view, the Roman Catholic Church in the South was, was, was almost unique in the South in not aggressively justifying slavery and apartheid. Now, they acquiesced in it. But believe me, you know, as somebody who's lived through the gay people are criminals and now gay people are just icky, uh, it's much different acquiescing in something and aggressively supporting it, uh, supporting these evil institutions. And on gay rights, the Catholic Church's official position has been that it's, it's unchristian to discriminate based on sexual orientation. Now, you know, they're still against gay marriage and lots of other things, but the Catholic position uh, is, a, is a very humane, worked out, and in many ways, very admirable tradition. And, and that's very communitarian, it seems to me. Uh, and, and, and where that ties back into the, so I think it's all intermixed. Then it ties back into the liberal tradition, that I like the idea that, as de Tocqueville says, we're a nation of groups that have different normative commitments. That's also Robert Putnam, you know, to give it a more no modern gloss, the bowling alone guy. Uh, and this is one of the things, we're a nation of joiners. I think it's good for human beings to be able to join. And it's good for human, being, human beings to have like a choice of things they can join, so that not everybody joins the New York Times Club, which is what the Yale Law School is all about. It's very, no it is, it's like a madrasa. The Yale Law School is like, the, a New York Times madrasa. And I think it's really bad. And y'all are probably not as madrasa-like as the Yale Law School is. And that's, that is better for you all, in my opinion, to be Southerner. Um, so, uh, so I like that, that, that uh, we have a lot of different groups. They have different normative commitments. And I think the trick of democratic pluralism, which is what we are, we're both democratic and pluralistic, is to keep the stakes of politics manageable so that the different groups can flourish and rise or fall based upon their attraction to you know, new, new entrants, young people, 
um, without the state interfering with them too much, uh, but also advancing the ability of everybody to like make their way in society. You know, so that the Catholic view is not the view that becomes totalizing, so that gay people can't do this, get married, etc. So that's my kind of little vision. But I'm with you on this communitarian thing. So that'd be a, like a separate lecture. So you get someone to do, uh, get Sarah to do the uh, Cohen lecture next year on a sort of a communitarian take on the discrimination stuff. That'd be really good. Oh, yeah, yeah. In, our, in my property class, I was pretty surprised by how kind of reactive people were about things like handicapped parking spaces mm -hmm. and kind of how, you know, uninformed generally the American public is, with, you know, as opposed to things like like racial equality on, mm -hmm. on disability rights. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, I, I certainly can. I'm not an expert. I'll give you what I think, and you can correct, please correct me. I think it's gone through exactly the same stage that we're talking about here, you know, this, these three historical stages. And I think that's reflected in the law to a certain extent. That uh, people with disability, and remember each disability is kind of different. Uh, uh, blindness has a certain history uh, that's not the same as other kinds of disabilities, for example. But a lot of, and mental disability has different kind of history than many physical disabilities, okay? Um, but here it goes, the malignant variation. That, the natural law trope was, you know, the leprosy trope, that people with disabilities were, were uh, degraded, <coughs> uh, uh, de despised of God, even. Uh, and, it, you know, the disability was considered a punishment, a natural punishment, uh, and that you were naturally inferior. Uh, and that, you know, it produced horrendous laws. Uh, this, you might not know, you probably know a lot, but here's what I bet you don't know. In America, we had ugly laws throughout the 19th century. Municipalities, they had cross-dressing laws. You probably knew that, that it was a crime. In Denver, I might add, I can assure you of that, I know that law. It's a crime in Denver to cross-dress in the 19th and most of the 20th century. So the women who are in pants would be violating the law, men in dresses. But most, many American cities also had ugly laws, which made it a crime to appear in public deformed or ugly, et cetera. And you can imagine these laws were very unevenly enforced. This is all totally at the discretion of the police. So horrible persecution in that period. Uh, and Buck versus Bell. I mean, there are Supreme Court cases you can point to, like Buck versus Bell. That's alleged. That's not even real mental disability. That was suspected mental disability, and there was sterilization. Sterilization statutes. This was a nation of sterilization statutes. 20th century was obsessed with sterilization, and it was mainly addressed with people against people with disabilities. Okay. Uh, disability rights movements, and I would say movements because different disabilities, different movements, uh, have argued throughout the 20th century uh, that uh, that variation in mental ability and physical ability is tolerable. And this has produced calls for anti-discrimination laws, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and again, there's been pushback. You know, the, the pushback has been uh, that if, 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 I have, uh, if, if I have not, if I'm not able to discriminate against people with mental or physical disabilities, uh, then my business, you know, uh, I don't want to associate, freedom of association, freedom to have business, freedom of contract, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these arguments have all been made, though they're not as made uh, so much recently. Um, and a lot of the same, uh, no promo, no Justice Holmes and Buck versus Bell. I'm not going to tell you what Justice Holmes. Read Buck versus Bell. You know, uh, Justice Holmes uh, is that's that's the classic no promo decision, Buck versus Bell, where Justice Holmes upheld the Virginia sterilization law uh, for sterilizing children, basically children. Uh, because a moron doctor thought that the child was mentally disabled. It was incredible. Jay Gould went back and found out that the woman, as she later became, uh, was abled mentally, and that the whole sterilization had been a mistake. 
on the state of the part of the state of Virginia. Crossing the Rubicon, you see that decision making regret, maybe not that so much. You see a lot of the same tropes. And then the argument, it seems to me, and again, I'm not like a leader in the disability rights movement, my very dear friend High Feldblum is. Uh, uh, the argument, it seems to me, if I were a conceptualist of the movement, would be uh, that actually uh, things that are considered disabilities are actually fairly arbitrary in terms of the ability to do the job. The disability is actually benign. Now, that's not the same to say that there's no difference between a sighted person and a person who has weak vision or a person with no vision. But the argument is that the capacity to be a citizen, to vote, uh, to do all sorts of stuff, to be an employee, to be a productive member of society, to be married, there were marriage restrictions until very recently. I think there was one in Utah that was just struck down a few years ago, a marriage restriction. People with disabilities not allowed to marry, some people with disabilities not allowed to marry. Those were, again, marriage, a repository of discrimination and prejudice. Anyway, the argument now would be that, that this is uh, benign. Now, the, the wrinkle for a lot of disability rights is that it's benign if you accommodate us. So there's often an accommodate, and that's Americans with Disabilities Act, for example, other statutes. That, but uh, disability rights movement didn't originate the idea of accommodation. Pregnancy discrimination originated the right of accommodation. It's about the same time as the disability rights movement. So the argument would be, with some accommodation, then it's benign. It shouldn't make a difference, for the most part. And you do see the law reflecting that, uh, the, again, this movement. Uh, and I can guarantee you, I can tell you lots of lurid statutes in the olden days, not just the, uh, and then the, the tolerable, and then toward benign. Now, I don't exactly know where America is now. Uh, on that Supreme Court is certainly not on the benign page. Supreme Court engaged in a campaign of vigorous undermining of the ADA. Now, I know the ADA was recently amended to override most of the Supreme Court opinions. I don't, I think Bragdon versus Abbott's the only one I can even think of when the Supreme Court did not rule against an, uh, an, uh, an application of the ADA to actually protect people. It, it spent almost all the decisions creating loopholes and, and exceptions uh, in, in the ADA, some of which have been listed. So that's the way I see that. And I also think it's, it's a campaign. That, <clears throat> again, the, the campaign is, um, does business have a liberty to exclude people with disabilities? Huge spillover effects for that. Um, how pushy does the state want to be in enforcing anti-discrimination policies? Uh, George Bush, George H.W. Bush, presided over and strongly supported the ADA. A lot, of, a lot of people of various orientations and whatnot. And does protection of liberty enhance the function of political democracy? I think that's an easy one. So the normative variables, it seems to me, fit very well. Though I, I think the disabilities thing often might depend on what kind of disability. Maybe mental disabilities are going to be treated differently from physical ones in some ways. You hit the nail with your head. I think you're quite right about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the decision made, yes, it's an old trope. I guess the only way I'm saying it's new, it's new in the Constitution. But yeah, I like that. I, I mean, I, I hate what you're talking about. <laughs> but I, I think it's a really a brilliant point is that, um, well, you know, in Spain, in, in, in the Inquisition period, you know, one of the stupidest, you know, most counterproductive policies in world history was the Spanish Inquisition. And it was a gradual policy leading up to it. Uh, a lot of Jews in Spain were like forced to convert. You know, holy decision-making regret. Um, so it, it's uh, the more the more excellent uses of history are the flip side of it, and that is like forced conversions. And that, but yes, I quite I quite agree. The decision-making regret is is not a, is not novel in the philosophical or human history sense. I like that example. Yeah.
Well, we've got to get Hartman. Hartman is one of my many former students out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, if you want a big one, <coughs> he'll answer that, and I'm not sure about this. The big one, I guess, would be language minorities. I mean, big one. I mean, one with a fair number of people. I mean, there are other obvious candidates that I think I'm sure about. Transgender people. You're already seeing this, you know, in Inda. Uh, there, there's not a, lot of not a lot of legal protection for transgender people at this point, but there's a heap more than there was 10 years ago. There's been a revolution. But transgender people, uh, I'm not just thinking about transsexuals, but you know, also uh, trans, transvestites, people who like to dress in the attire of the opposite sex. It's a potentially very large group. Um, intersex people, uh, there's not a lot of discrimination against them, partly because most of them are successfully closeted, etc. cetera. Um, uh, uh, Arab Americans, uh, Muslims, Muslim Americans. You know, it's, it's kind of ethnicity and religion, but it has a different angle. I mean, these are, these are growing groups, minority groups in our society. And garb comes back into play. Remember I talked about the ugly laws and the cross-dressing laws? They're now garb laws in France and these other places in Europe. Uh, but so there, I think there are a number of other places this is going to this is going to show up, and <clears throat> and I do see, you know, uh, after 9/11, one of the very few people, even in academe, uh, to speak out vigorously uh, against racial profiling or ethnicity profiling or whatnot was my colleague at Georgetown, David Cole, um, when it was very unpopular, you know, whatever chance he ever would have had of being named to anything evaporated because he spoke out in favor. You know, criticizing the Bush administration very aggressively for rounding up uh, people based in a large part, if not exclusively, on ethnicity and rumors and stuff like that. Uh, and I think it really is kind of, it's a modern disgrace. This is, this is one of the most disgraceful things our government has done. Though apparently many of the people the Bush administration rounded up were culpable of something. Uh, but frankly, you know, if you took a random sample out of the New Haven phone book and arrested them, I think you'd get the same numbers. I would say the same thing about the Yale faculty. You know, <laughs> uh, if you just rounded them up and sent them all to Guantanamo, uh, I think you'd have a lot of malefactors that would be sopped up with the, the ones that were technically in, innocent. Well, anyway, I think the big uh, thing is language. I think it's language. Uh, and accent. Now, now, this is not original. Mario Matsuda wrote a wonderful article in the Yale Law Journal about 20 years ago on accent discrimination. Uh, color discrimination, you know, which is somewhat different from race. In Brazil and other countries, they don't talk about race discrimination so much as they talk about color discrimination, color hue. Uh, my colleague, Ian Ayres, and my colleague, Christine Joles, are doing this fabulous but weird uh, experiment where they put on eBay baseball cards, and the hands were holding the baseball cards, and then you would bid on them, right? And <clears throat> there was what they called a white hand, like this one, and then a black hand, which was darker than this one, okay? And that was called the black hand, the African hand. Now, what's bizarre about this is, how can you tell that someone's African based on a hand? Yeah, you know, I asked him at the workshop, I said, well, but how do you know it wasn't Latino? or, or uh, Arab, or, or um, um, J Japanese, or Chinese, or Italian, or there are lots of ethnicities that you could be in. You would have a hand that would kind of look like this one. And they'd chosen not like a really dark hand, but like a medium dark hand. They'd probably gone through a deliberate process. But they were like, oh, yes, this is African, 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 African. And like everybody will think this is African. And so this is a very sad commentary on America and on the Yale Law School. Uh, that, that people think by looking at this hand that they know anything much about the rest of the person, right? And they're making all these jokes. And then I asked them, I said, well, maybe it'd be more interesting. Again, I think it's all nonsense that you're talking about this African da-da-da. What about color discrimination? Why don't you do, like, four different hands? And one of them extremely dark, one of them extremely light, 
and then two in between. And see if, if there's a continuous thing from light to darkest, like in color. See, I think that's, because that, that, we're becoming a multiracial society. It's, it's all multiracial. And once race loses signification along those lines, this is Brazil. Yeah, this is my experience in Brazil, that color takes over a lot of uh, prejudice and discrimination and stuff that, that uh, the work that race used to do. So I would say language and, and color would be biggies. More, more Hartman. You've got to get Hartman. Come on, Hartman. Oh, Hartman. Oh, God. <laughs> Okay, oh, yeah, you're a hard one. You're a hard one. 